Okay, here we go with our first lecture for Luchenberg. Um, this is going to lead us up to uh, the inauguration of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, a little background about Luchenberg. The book uh, itself was first published in 1963. It's always useful for you to know when a book is published because it tells you something about the time that's going on. And also a little historiographic discussion tells us why um, it doesn't, uh, the introduction doesn't function like other introductions do for uh, books in the social sciences and history. Uh, Luchenberg wrote his book in 1963, which means that it was published in 1963, which means he was writing it in the late 60s, uh, or I mean late 50s and early 1960s, which means that when he was writing it, it was parts of it at least were, were right around the time of the election of 1960. 1960 is a, an election year that pits a very um, conservative uh, Republican candidate, Richard Nixon, uh, against a liberal Democrat by the name of John F. Kennedy. And they have two different visions of what the role of government is. Um, Nixon's part of the Eisenhower tradition, which is a very limited role for government. Uh, John F. Kennedy is envisioning a much more active role uh, for the federal government. And so Luchenberg's writing his book about the Great Depression and the New Deal when it's talking about a very active federal government. So this is some of the background for that. It also explains why, uh, 1963 explains why Luchenberg doesn't have to tell us what he's going to do because in 1963, generally, the expectation in a history book was that the book is going to focus on presidential archives, the speeches, uh, financial information, economic information, political information. This is what history traditionally was. And so Luchenberg doesn't have to tell you what he's going to do. That's what he's going to do. So uh, Luchenberg is also, uh, uh, I suppose, one of the deans of, um, of uh, studies on the New Deal. And um, he's someone you have to pay uh, close attention to if you're interested in history. Uh, because he is one of the most prominent historians on uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal, and he's still around kicking. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the preface through chapter two, uh, and we're going to begin with the triggering event for the Great Depression. So um, the thing to bear in mind is this uh, stock market crash triggers the Great Depression. It is not the cause of the Great Depression. Um, most economists um, agree that the problems of the Great Depression are a function of uh, a structural inequality between uh, the wealthy uh, and the working class. Uh, that this too much of the wealth was captured by too small a percentage of the population, which is the structural problem that leads to the Great Depression. Uh, and um, this issue is the one that will have to be addressed in order to emerge from the Great Depression. So uh, I say most economists, uh, not every economist believes this, but I would say it's probably on par with uh, climate deniers. Um, they are a small percentage of people who uh, question whether or not um, uh, human action is involved in the uh, climate. Uh, and 97% uh, of climate uh, scientists believe there is human action that's involved in a warming climate. Uh, in similar fashion, the vast majority of economists believe this is the issue. So uh, before we talk about the bubble bursting, let's talk a little bit about structural inequality. Uh, here are some charts. I put these on Blackboard as well, so you can find them if you would like. Uh, this is the share of wealth held by the bottom 99% and the top 1% uh, from 1922 to 1998. So by 1929, which is when the stock market crashes, 44.2% uh, of the wealth was held by 1% of the population, meaning the remaining 99% uh, of the population held just a little bit more of, uh, than half. Um, so you can see the trend lines. Uh, by 1998, that number had um, uh, increased to 38.1%. Um, and you can see the long-term trend lines there. Uh, what else do we have? This is the wealth held by uh, the top 0.1%. So uh, 
less than 1%. As you see in 1929, 25% uh, uh, of the wealth was held by 0.1% uh, of the nation. The ensuing crash, uh, the war, the tax um, uh, reaping of uh, various assets led to a decline in the percentage of wealth held by the 0.1%. Uh, and then during the Reagan years, it begins a climb that uh, continues up until the present day. So an increasing percentage of the wealth is held by a relatively small percentage of the population. Uh, some more. Here's uh, a little bar graph. The gray is the top 1%. The red is the bottom 99%, as we see in 1929. Uh, more than 40% of the wealth was held by the top 1%, with the remaining 99% um, making up uh, roughly 55%. Uh, you can see the trend lines again over to the year 2000. And then because I like to continue uh, these examples, oops, not that one, sorry. Uh, this one. Here we see um, figures up through 2016. Move that up just a tad. Um, and again, we have um, the median share of household income. Um, the top 1% have uh, roughly 40% of the national income. So uh, this is a trend line that we have seen um, decline uh, since 1929 and is now recovered uh, back to those what they say the roaring 20 days. So uh, back to our note. So this structural inequality, what does that mean for um, what does that mean for the economy? Well, the 1920s were known as the Roaring Twenties, and in retrospect, we can understand why it was roaring and why it was structurally still uh, unequal. Uh, a series of new technologies were created in the 1920s uh, and became available for purchase. Uh, and everybody who could purchase these things, things like durable goods is what the economists call them, so uh, talking about uh, refrigerators, talking about washing machines, talking about uh, expensive household items or expensive investment items that consumers could purchase, the most important of which uh, in the 1920s economy was the automobile. Um, automobile became something that was available uh, for a number of people to purchase. Everybody who could uh, afford to purchase an automobile by the late 1920s had done so. Uh, and Partly this is a problem of advertisers. Advertisers had not convinced the American public to throw away perfectly good stuff to acquire new stuff. So everybody bought a car and the car was durable enough that it lasted for years and so nobody bought another car. Um, generally each household had one car. It's not until uh, the later years after that that people began to convince um, the consuming public, advertisers began to convince the consuming public, they had to discard perfectly useful things like cars to get the new brand uh, of that make and model so that you were more stylish. Uh, it also opened up the number of drivers, it became acceptable for women to drive, uh, and then teenagers, and so the, the per household um, number of cars increased as well as continually cycling, cycling over for new cars. But that's in the future. Uh, in the 1920s, by the end of the 1920s, everybody who purchased a car could purchase a car. And lots of people who couldn't afford to purchase a car had purchased a car. And they were buying things on what at the time was known as on time. So you make a monthly payment on the automobile, the refrigerator, the couch, whatever you have purchased. So you can't afford to purchase it outright, but you have put it on time and you make a monthly payment in order to acquire it. Uh, all these things were uh, causing uh, certain sectors of the economy to boom. It's not, looking back, it's not universal. Uh, farmers were hurting well through the 1920s, uh, well before the arrival of the Great Depression. So um, all these things are continuing until uh, the stock market uh, bubble burst on October 29th, 1930. Uh, it doesn't matter exactly what these numbers are. I will just tell you for 1929, it was a lot. 16 million shares were sold on that day. <clears throat> this was instead, we talked previously about the railroad being a bubble economy that led to the panic uh, of 1873. Uh, this is a bubble economy in the entire stock market. Uh, 
worsening the situation in the stock market is that there was widespread speculation in which a number of people were buying the stocks on margin. Here's how margin works. Margin means uh, I want to acquire a stock, let's say Wichita State University stock selling for a dollar a share. Uh, I want to buy 100 shares of WSU stock at a dollar, but I only have $10. So in one way, I can only buy 10 shares, or I can buy uh, 100 shares, pay for 10 shares, and put the remaining, remaining $90 on the margin, right? which means I owe that money, uh, but you're allowing me to purchase it now. Okay, So um, when you put up your $10 and buy $100 worth of shares, that means you're on the hook for another 90. Uh, let's say overnight, the price of Wichita State uh, university stock goes up to two dollars. Okay, so now you have a hundred shares of Wichita State University stock that are um, that you uh, have bought at a dollar a share, but are now trading at two dollars a share. You could sell those uh, hundred shares of Wichita State University stock at two dollars, pay off the remi remaining ninety dollars on the margin, and walk away with a tidy hundred dollar profit. Right, uh, or you could take those paper profits, now your stock is worth $200, and use that as your margin to purchase more stock. So you could buy more Wichita State University stock, or you could diversify and use um, that stock to serve as your uh, down payment um, on another series of stock, K-State, KU, whatever, right? Uh, uh, Ford, uh, Radiovac, whatever. So in that fashion, with a very small amount of money, you can acquire a huge paper uh, portfolio in which on paper, as long as the prices keep going up, you're making big profits, right? Uh, you can cash out at any time, pay off what's on your margin and walk away with a tidy profit. But because people thought the stock market would continue to go up, they continued to purchase more shares and put more and more on the margin. So when the market bursts on October 29th, that means the stock share prices drop precipitously. So people who were um, buying stocks suddenly found a stock that they that had they had owned that was uh, trading for five dollars um, is now dropping below two dollars, and then it continued to plummet. And if you purchase it at a dollar and the price went below a dollar, now your your stock is worth less than what you purchased it for. The problem, of course, is that you've only put up 10% and put the rest on the margin. Uh, brokerage houses, who were the ones who sold you these stocks on the margin, issued what's called a margin call. A margin call means you have to pay off what you owe on the stocks. The reason why brokerage houses do that is because they need the cash. Uh, and they need the cash because they've also been investing in this process and suddenly find themselves short. So when the stock market tanks, it took a lot of people with it who had built up paper profits, but had acquired real debts. So going back to our original Wichita State University example, uh, you may have purchased it uh, at a dollar a share and put up $10 for your 100 shares, meaning you own $90, and the price may have dropped down to 10 cents a share. The brokerage house doesn't care that the stock is trading at 10 cents a share. It cares that you owe it $90 the remaining margin call. In this fashion, a lot of uh, uh, people were driven into bankruptcy as well as a lot of institutions because not only were brokerage houses and individual stock purchasers, but also banks and other financial institutions were investing in this and buying stuff on the margin. This stock market burst triggered the Great Depression. But again, the problem is of um, this structural inequality. And what it boils down to is there is underconsumption and too much production. Too many goods were being purchased or being produced to be purchased by the consumers. Consumers who had a small uh, percentage of the wealth of the nation. So, for example, uh, in 1929, uh, automobile output produced in factories. There were 4.5 million uh, automobiles produced that year. Those automobiles were produced in factories by workers and in the late 1920s, uh, automobile production was similar to railroad production in the mid 19th century. 
it had an outsized role in the economy. So it's not only uh, the automobiles themselves, but then to produce these automobiles, um, you need steel, uh, which comes from steel industry, you need rubber, you need wood, you need all the ancillary uh, components that go into a car. So it's a large sector of the, um, of the nation's economy. So in 1929, 4.5 million cars were uh, built, uh, sent out to dealers where they sat on their lots. Uh, at the factories, they filled up their parking lots with produced cars, and then the factory lines shut down. And they shut down because nobody was buying cars, right? Uh, in 1932, automobile production declined to 1.1 million, and very few of those cars were sold, right? So this is a crash in the industrial sector because of overproduction and underconsumption. There weren't enough people to purchase it. Uh, too much money was concentrated in the wealthy, wealthy's hand and not enough in the average consumer, so they lacked the resources to buy up this production. Um, some other examples. The national income in 1929 was 80 billion. Anytime you see a number end in a billion, it's a very rough estimate, so I don't want you to get hung up on the number, I want you to pay attention to the relationship. So 1929, $80 billion was the nation's income. Uh, 1932, it was almost half, dropped down to 50 billion. Uh, industrial construction, in 1929, $949 million was invested in industrial construction, building new factories, extending lines, building new equipment. Uh, by 1932, that number had dipped to 74 million. Industrial construction also means that factories aren't building stuff, which means the people who do the building aren't building it either. So this um, 1929 crash triggered a stunning uh, economic descent uh, that we come to call the Great Depression. It's the worst in our nation's history. Uh, and the problem is that how does one address it? Well, traditionally, the United States had faced economic problems before, and the, the solution had always been the same sell your excess stuff abroad, right? So if you produce too much stuff, then people can't buy it here in the United States, find somebody else to buy. And when you ship things around the globe, uh, other people buy up uh, that excess stock. So they buy, let's say automobiles. So they're buying automobiles, they're removing that surplus inventory from the, the factory parking lots, the factory then sells off all its extra cars, it needs new, new cars constructed, it hires workers back who start making cars, who sell it around, the workers have money in their pockets, they can buy new stuff, and so the economy restarts. Traditionally, that's how we had resolved our problems. Um, in 1929, which was not clearly understood at that time, but is glaringly obvious um, now, is that this is not just a United States economic problem, it's a global problem. So there was nobody to purchase this excess stuff. So this excess stuff just sat on the lots. The companies could not discard this excess stuff to make new stuff, so they couldn't keep the workers working, so they fired and laid off all the workers. Without that income, workers couldn't buy stuff, and then they couldn't sell stuff abroad. And then in a misguided attempt to aid this process, Congress had its only major piece of legislation before the New Deal, known as the Hawley Smoot Tariff, which was a disaster. The logic behind it works like this. Uh, we have too many cars for sale. Ford and GM have cars on the lot. Um, they can't sell, right? Uh, so um, there's also car lots that have uh, Fiats and they have uh, Mercedes Benz and they have BMWs. So all those car lots are filled with cars. Now, if someone has the wherewithal to go down and purchase a car, if they go down and purchase a BMW car, that means it removes one from the dealer's lot, which means it removes one from uh, the depot where the excess BMWs are stored waiting to get to the dealer, which means the factory can ship one more car across the ocean from Germany um, to replace that empty spot, meaning the factory is one car closer to uh, getting rid of its surplus and going back to making new cars. This will aid the German factory, BMW, making uh, these cars, and it won't help the United States. So Congress said, we don't want people buying cars from foreign countries, we want them buying from the United States. So what we're gonna do is put a tariff, a tax, on these imported goods. So that if somebody has $300 to go buy a new car, the BMW with this tariff is now $500, whereas the Ford and GM is still 
So they would take the $300 and purchase the car, which will aid American consumers. Now the logic um, or the illogic of that is immediately apparent. If we put a tax on imported goods from other countries, they're going to respond by putting a tax on our goods. We don't have to stretch our minds too far. We're seeing it play out with the current administration. So this sparks tit for tat tariffs. So our goods, which normally would be shipped around the globe, are then being hit with tariffs. So then people in other countries aren't buying our stuff, right? We're not buying other people's stuff, which shuts down global trade, worsening the Great Depression. It was uh, incredibly ill-advised. Um, and it served to make the, the economic problems of depression worse. Now, uh, I'm going to let you in that on something that was apparently a big secret to some folks. It's not really secret. Uh, I could tell you it's been known by historians for a long time, uh, but within the last few years, a few folks from uh, one end of the political spectrum had discovered that the New Deal didn't solve the Great Depression. It didn't. What solved the Great Depression was World War II. What the New Deal served to do was to make the Great Depression um, less awful, right? Uh, absent these uh, uh, things that Franklin Delano Roosevelt did in the New Deal, the Great Depression would have been even worse uh, and would have resulted in far more misery and death. <clears throat> the place to see this most clearly is the unemployment problem. These unemployment figures are, uh, are industrial employment, uh, they don't include the agricultural sector, which at this time was a large, uh, not the largest, but a large, a much larger than uh, it is today component of the, uh, the nation's workforce. So this is just industrial employment, but it's still very a significant set of figures. So in 1929, the unemployment rate uh, was 3.2%, which uh, generally uh, economists call full employment, meaning anybody looking for a job can find a job. With the collapse of the stock market and the ensuing Great Depression that followed, the unemployment rate reached 8.7 by 1930, 15.9 by 1931, 23.6 by 1932. That's almost a quarter of the industrial workforce who are unemployed. Uh, in 1932, that 50% uh, of the African American community was unemployed. Um, so uh, as you see through these figures, it continues through the 1930s up to 1938. As late as 1938, the unemployment rate was still 19%. Now we are almost uh, close to a decade into this Great Depression. Almost 20% of the population in, is unemployed, and some of them have been unemployed for years. The misery of this unemployment was uh, a problem that could not be readily solved. Even as late as 1941, when the United States factories were back to beginning to produce war materials, not for the United States yet, we're not involved until the end of 1941, but even as late as 1941, uh, the unemployment rate was almost 10%. That is uh, incredible. Uh, and after 1941, there's no unemployment at all because uh, a great way to solve unemployment issues is to sop up your extra workers and put them in khaki. Right? And then all those people need the material for war. So uh, World War II solved the Great Depression. Uh, so Luchenberg's book is about what he calls the Roosevelt Revolution, and it is truly a revolution in how the government operates. Um, this is a, an issue that is resolved um, by the war, but is eased by the, uh, the approaches taken by Franklin Delano. Uh, before we begin with what Roosevelt did, uh, we should talk about what the political class was doing before uh, his inauguration. So uh, the place to begin is with uh, poor Hubert, Herbert Hoover. So poor Hoover is fairly and unfairly blamed for the Great Depression. So let's talk uh, first about um, fairly. So Hoover was the uh, third in a string of Republican presidents who had emphasized a very low level of federal involvement in the nation's life. Um, Harding, uh, Coolidge, and then Hoover um, believe that the market is self-regulating and that things will fix themselves. In fact, Hoover said, we just have to wait out this Great Depression, that the economy will recover as it always did. The problem for Mr. Hoover is that he didn't understand that this is not uh, 
the same type of economic problem that we had seen before. That because it's global and because of the depth of it, that the old solutions were not going to resolve this issue in a timely fashion. And that a much more active role would be necessary by the federal government. Because of his uh, worldview, Hoover could not make that leap. <clears throat> so he is fairly uh, criticized for the Great Depression because he couldn't get his mind around the idea that uh, new tactics had to be adopted. Now, he's also somewhat unfairly because out of the three uh, Republican presidents in the 1920s, uh, Hoover was the one that probably was the, the most um, sensitive to the responsibility that society had to those who are, are worse off. As you have seen in that film, it was Herbert Hoover who ran a massive government uh, or an independent operation to provide uh, food for the starving people during and after World War I. He directed this program. He also had enormous experience uh, in the government, having served in various cabinet roles. Um, he also was an engineer, which is, I understand it, an engineer who resolves difficult problems through systematic uh, and scientific approaches. So on paper, Herbert Hoover was the perfect man for this challenge of the Great Depression but he failed the test miserably. And he failed because he couldn't change the way he saw the world. Uh, he just could not envision the federal government would have to take such a large role, right? So um, the 1932 election hits uh, the, Dem the Democrat, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, against the Republican, Herbert Hoover. Uh, Republicans had run on the program of, you like this economy, uh, vote for Republicans, which worked very well through the 1920s, but when the market tanked, um, that's not a viable uh, argument. Uh, so Hoover is sure to lose, and then he had some stumbles on uh, things to uh, ensure, the most famous of which is the, the bonus army. So um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, says very little during the campaign because he knows that um, he's going to win the election and all, all he can do is, is mess it up by saying the wrong thing. So Hoover uh, runs against uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Roosevelt wins a large victory, right? Now this is a quirk in the way the nation's uh, system works. Um, you win election in the first Tuesday uh, in November. That's when the federal elections are held. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt won the presidency, but you don't officially become president until you're sworn in. Now, uh, dating back to the founding of the nation, the Constitution had dictated that the president would be sworn in in March. The logic of this is because the founding fathers wanted a, a simple farmer to be able to win the presidency so he can be voted in the president after the fall harvest, and then he could put his spring planting in, and then he could go take over the job of uh, being president. So to build that in, they made the election in early November after the harvest, and they put in uh, when the president can ta will, will take office by being sworn in after the spring planting, which would be uh, in before March, right? Uh, or so the idea was. So um, this is a long gap, which normally um, is just a quirk, but in this case, it proved to be uh, dangerous to the nation. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt wins in November, uh, but he's not due to be sworn in until March. Um, during that time, the nation's economy tanked, uh, and uh, a number of things were going on that shook people's faith in the system. Hoover's still president, although rejected by the populace, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt is the man to take over the job, but he can't do anything yet. So we have this huge gap in between November and March in which things got very bad. Uh, so uh, the business sector, one of the pillars of American society, um, was Im immediately discredited. Um, the tanking of the economy suggested that businessmen didn't know what they were doing. The inability to resolve this issue over the first couple of years of the Great Depression further undercut that. And then a series of congressional investigations into what happened uh, revealed that businessmen, at least some of them, were engaged in some serious fraud, right? So some examples. Uh, 
Um, there is a company in uh, the company known as the American Tobacco Company, which was headquartered in Chicago. Uh, their uh, chief executives were paid a million dollars a year in 1932 money or 1930 money. Right, that's a serious amount of money, but they manipulated their uh, incomes so they paid no taxes. Right, so by exposing or utilizing loopholes in the tax code, they didn't pay any taxes, although they had a million dollar income. At the same time, the city of Chicago was issuing IOUs to its employees, including teachers. Some teachers had not been paid in a month or more, and so teachers were reported to be feigning at their desks because they hadn't eaten for days. This uh, avoidance of tax burden by the wealthy undercut the business, uh, the people's uh, opinion of business. I'll give you another example. Uh, a banker uh, took a loan out uh, on, uh, from his own bank to buy stock in his bank, except he, he, he put what's known as a put, which he was betting that the stock price would go down. How did he know the stock price would go down? Because he knew uh, what the return rate uh, was on people paying off their loans. He knew that his bank was going to go bankrupt shortly, but because he was the only one that knew it, he borrowed money from his own bank to bet against the bank staying healthy, when the then reported the, the stock prices for, um, or reported what the uh, economic health of was the bank, the stock dropped tremendously and he cashed in all that money on those puts, right? Uh, he then donated that money to his wife for a dollar. So technically she paid a dollar's worth of tax on the income. All these sort of tricks of avoiding taxation by businessmen and the wealthy uh, were revealed, or at least some of them are, and it discredited the whole business sector. <clears throat> Banks themselves were in desperate uh, shape. I put a link up to a small segment um, from uh, the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. It's on course materials, and it's the run on the bank scene. If you haven't seen that film, it's fantastic, but take a look at the run on the bank. It illustrates it. Banks run on faith, it's a strange comment to make. A well-run bank lends out $13 for every dollar that somebody puts in their bank. By lending that money out, that means that if everybody showed up at once to take their money out, the bank wouldn't be able to pay all that money back, right? Banks make money by, or they did traditionally, now they charge us fees, but uh, in the past, banks made money by lending money out to people who pay it back with interest. The more money you lend out, the more money you make. The downside is by lending that money out, people's money is not sitting in a vault. It's out in the, the community. If people don't pay back their loans, like if they lose their jobs or their business goes out of business or whatever, right? Uh, if there's an economic crash like the Great Depression, then people don't pay their money back and then people need the cash from their banks and they go to get it if the banks don't have it, they have to shut their doors and go out of business. At this time, uh, there was no, what we know as FDIC. We'll see where the FDIC comes in. What that means is if your bank goes out of business and you've been busily putting your money away for your retirement, you're out of luck, right? And that's what's happened to banks. There's a number of runs on banks in which governors are forced to do the following thing. They declare temporary bank closures. So nobody can get their money out in a desperate attempt to prevent these banks from being driven out of business. Congress had been ineffectual, right? The only thing they had produced was the Hawley Swoop tariff, which was clearly, uh, was apparently a disaster. It was a disaster. Uh, and they had no other solutions. So Congress is sitting around wondering what to do. Strangely, in this 1932 election, even though things look very grim, the people were not radicalized. Right, um, the Communist Party uh, received only 120,000 votes in the 1932 election. Uh, the uh, Socialist Party, not as radical as the Communist Party, received a lower percentage of the vote total in 1932 than it did in the 1920 and 1912 elections. People were upset with the way things were going and they responded the way they traditionally do. They voted for the other party. So they voted Republicans out and they voted Democrats in, but by and large, this is not a uh, time of panic. 
All these things are the background for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's inaugural speech, which is quite an important speech, right? Um, people, the nation is paralyzed because nobody seems to be taking this serious and then uh, seriously. And then Franklin Delano Roosevelt comes and gives his famous talk in which he uses some stirring phrases, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, right? So those are some of the famous phrases. Uh, he also uses as a throwaway line, um, he calls his program is going to be a new deal. That new deal becomes a shorthand for what he's going to do. So Roosevelt's speech is important in that uh, aspect that he, he demonstrates that somebody's taking it seriously, but there's another aspect that demonstrates what Franklin Delano Roosevelt's doing. Um, and I'll finish here and then we'll pick up with that next time uh, on lecture two of Luchenberg. So uh, here's what he says. Uh, this is, this is a, a part of a speech that doesn't get, I think, enough attention. He says, uh, I'm declaring a bank holiday, a federal holiday, uh, in which all banks will be closed. And I call upon the Congress to come in an emergency session to help me deal with this economic disaster of the Great Depression, right? Not known as the Great Depression yet. Um, this emergency session uh, is something that Roosevelt, as the chief executive, is calling, right? Um, and he says, if the Congress cannot or the Congress will not act in this emergency, then I will use my powers uh, under um, as, uh, as the commander in chief uh, under the emergency powers of the Constitution to take action. What in effect he's saying is that if Congress won't fulfill its legislative duties and come immediately in a special session to deal with this issue of the Great Depression, then I as the chief executive will act on my own. He's suggesting that he's going to act as a dictator if the Congress won't address it. This um, does not come to pass because Congress falls over itself saying we want to come and work on these issues, but it's a, it's a measure of how desperate these times are that the simple fact that a chief executive said he was going to do something and then uh, threatened that he would do it independently if nobody else did served as a bomb to the nation. All right, so uh, that's um, Luchenberg's uh, first bit. Uh, we'll uh, pick up with the, the next section from there. Again, if you have any questions, I invite you to post them onto Blackboard and I will see you next time.